on first year dnb first year dnb resident from sagar hospitals today i am going to discuss on bronchoscopy so bronchoscopy is a endoscopic technique which is helped to visualize the inside of the airways for diagnostic and therapeutic purposes and bronchoscopy is of two types one is rigid bronchoscopy the other one is flexible fiber optic bronchoscopy so let's have a brief history on bronchoscopy so bronchoscopy in 1897 gustav kilins performed first rigid bronchoscopy to remove the pork bone cavalier jackson established bronchoscopy as a standard diagnostic tool tool in 1905 and he used rigid bronchoscopy visually to inspect the trachea and main stem bronchi in 1920 in 1966 sigeto akeda invented flexible bronchoscope and he is considered as the father of fiber optic bronchoscopy flexible if fiber optic can... sir pawan if you can just stop here Yes, sir. Like if you if you look into the history of laparoscope, thoracoscope, or esophagoscopy, most of them started as rigid instruments. Yes, sir. Okay, and then later on, fiber optics came in, and so most of the scopes, endoscopy or thoracoscopy, laparoscopy, they all started as rigid scopes. Yes, sir. Continue. Yes. Let's have a fiber optic bronchoscopy. um which uh, which is long thin lighted tube to look at the airways and the flexible fiber optic bronchoscopy is used nowadays um more than that of the rigid bronchoscopy because it does not require any general anesthesia and uh, patient is more comfortable and uh, it offers better view of smaller airways and it helps to remove smaller biopsies during procedure so the uh, flexible bronchoscope is about 3 feet long and having a diameter less than 0.5 0.5 cm 0.5 cm 0.5 inch uh, and it has various channels having light channel and uh, having light channel and for visualization channel and uh, one for open channel so the image in the slide shows the light channel for proper visualization and the fiber optic light source will come and uh, uh, visualization channel for proper effective visualization of the structures and open channel for instrument and suctioning um, the, the suction is used to remove the airway secretions and instrumentations like uh, um, tiny metallic forceps is used to um, remove the tissue biopsies and also um to collect tissue uh, tissue cells for microscopic evaluation with the help of small brush wise so nowadays uh, video assisted flexible bronchoscopy is available in which we can see the um uh, we can see the images uh, over the monitor so various uses the diagnostic uses of the flexible bronchoscopy is it is used to evaluate the patients having persistent cough and it is more diagnostic importance in patients having hemoptysis hemoptysis and it also helps to evaluate the patients having change in voice and patients with abnormal chest x ray or ct it helps to evaluate and it helps to evaluate the lung cancer and in case of tuberculosis are in other infections to collect the bronchiola bronchio bronco alveolar lavage it is useful and uh, to wash out secretions in icu patients so the therapeutic uses of the flexible bronchoscopy like it helps to remove the foreign body um foreign body which causes airway obstruction and it also helps to remove the tumor it also helps to remove tumor biopsy and also debulking of the tumor in case of malignancy it can be done with rigid bronchoscopy and we can dilate our insertion of the stunts 
can be done in patients with stricture or fistula and it also helps to relieve the um, patients having tracheobronchial obstruction and insertion of endotracheal tube laser therapy and brachytherapy is also used in in laser therapy and brachytherapy it is used and tamponade of bleedings various diagnostic methods in flexible bronchoscopy like visual um, visual inspection and uh, proximal endo bronchial sampling so we can able to collect the bronchial alve bronco alveolar washing and uh, biopsy with the help of forceps and uh, and we can able to collect the tissue cells with the brush forceps and we send for the cytological and microbiological analysis and extra bronchial and distal sampling can be done through trans bronchial lung biopsies so let's have a look at the video clip which is a self explanatory regarding segmental anatomy and bronchoscopy in this film we perform a tour of the normal segmental anatomy of the bronchi by means of bronchoscopy on a healthy volunteer under local anesthesia After passage through the nose, the pharynx and the epiglottis, the glottis is reached. After inspection of the vocal cords and arytenoids, the bronchoscope is advanced into the trachea. While staying in the middle of the airway lumen, the trachea is carefully inspected. As here uh, Pawan, if you uh, what is not described in this video is or when you are looking at the epiglottis and the vocal cords you ask the patient to make a sound like ha e and then see the movement of the vocal cords whether both right and left vocal cords move equally or one of them is sluggish movement <clears throat> or if the vocal cord is uh, shifted to the lateral side or abducted to the medially and fixed in position that's one thing which is not described in this video and the other thing is the, the tracheal lumen that you are seeing now beautifully shows tracheal rings in the antero lateral part of the trachea the posterior membranous trachea which should be at the 6 o'clock position is, is is the membranous part and bulges into the trachea when you ask the patient to take a deep breath or a cough in patients with uh, mid third esophageal tumors major institutes routinely do a bronchoscopy to see whether the tracheal mucosa is infiltrating or not if the esophageal cancer is infiltrating the trachea then the mucosa does not bulge into the lumen of the trachea that's an indirect indication of esophageal serosal involvement and involvement of the trachea any questions at this stage no if sir. not continue power yeah rest of the segmental anatomy is beautifully shown in this video continue Eventually, we reach the main carina, where the left and right main bronchi originate. We then rotate the bronchoscope 90 degrees clockwise and enter the right main bronchus. At the end of the right main bronchus, we recognize several important anatomical landmarks. We identify the orifice of the right upper lobe, the right carina one, the orifice of the middle lobe. and the orifice of the right lower lobe we then enter the right upper lobe which divides into the apical segmental bronchus or rb1 the posterior segmental bronchus or rb2 and the anterior segmental bronchus or rb3 we then head back and extend the bronchoscope into the intermediate bronchus Here we identify the orifice of the middle lobe, the right carina two, the basal branches, and the apical. Can just pass it. Lower lobe. Yes, sir. If you can identify the apical segmental bronchus of the lower lobe, which is R B six, and the middle lobe bronchus are exactly opposite to each other. That's the orientation we do get on when we are doing bronchoscopy. 
once you get orientation of RB6, that is apical segmental bronchus, right opposite is the middle lobe bronchus. Then you enter into the middle lobe bronchus to see the two segmental bronchi. Continue. RB6. We then enter the middle lobe bronchus, which divides into the lateral segmental bronchus, or RB4, and the medial segmental bronchus, or RB5. After going back to the intermediate bronchus, we identify and enter the apical segment of the lower lobe, or RB6. When we extend further down the lower lobe, we reach the basal branches, the anterior basal branch, or RB8, the lateral basal branch, or RB9, and the posterior basal branch, or RB10. In most cases, the medial basal branch, or RB7, can be found at the medial side of the lower lobe bronchus. In this patient, however, the RB7 is absent. This picture from a different patient shows an example of the medial basal branch, or RB7, of the lower lobe. Pass it for one. Yes, sir. After inspection of the basal branches. If you realize it, flexible bronchoscope can go only to the origin of the segmental bronchus, not beyond. This is the major difference between the esophagoscopy or gastroscopy and colonoscopy. In bronchoscope, maximum you can go is at the origin of the segmental bronchus. That's all. Beyond which, you, if you want to do biopsy from the tumor or a lesion in the lung parenchyma, you need endobronchial ultrasound and ultrasound guided transbronchial biopsy. You need definitely need ultrasound guided because pulmonary artery and vein will be around the bronchial in the segmental bronchus. You can't blindly puncture through the bronchus. Continue. Go on. Yes. The bronchoscope is then slowly retracted up to the level of the main carina. After rotating 90 degrees counterclockwise, we enter the left main bronchus, which is significantly longer than the right main bronchus. At the end of the left main bronchus, we can identify the orifice of the lingula, the left carina 2, which separates the upper and lower lobe, and the apical segment, or LB6, of the lower lobe. We advance into the lower lobe and first inspect the LB6 that immediately divides into three subsegmental branches, LB6A, LB6B, and LB6C. We retract from LB6 and continue further into the lower lobe. Here, we can identify the anterior basal or LB8, lateral basal or LB9, and posterior basal, or LB10, segmental branches. A medial basal branch is usually absent on the left side. After inspection of the basal branches, the bronchoscope is slowly retracted in order to reach the left upper lobe. When entering the left upper lobe, we recognize the upper division bronchus, the left carina one, and the lingula. The lingula bronchus divides into the superior segmental bronchus, or LB4, and the inferior segmental bronchus, or LB5. The bronchoscope is retracted and advanced into the upper division bronchus. Here we can identify the apical posterior segmental bronchus, or LB1 plus 2, and the anterior segmental bronchus, or LB3. The LB1 plus 2 is often difficult to inspect because of its steep angle. Once the bronchoscope is positioned well, we can see the apical bronchus, or LB1, and the posterior bronchus, or LB2. Now, all segments have been inspected, 
and the bronchoscope is slowly retracted. So this is the schematic diagram. This is the schematic uh, representation of the bronchoscopic anatomy as shown in the, um, as explained in the previous slide, shown in this slide. So before performing the procedure, um, uh, preparation of the patient is very important. So we have to explain the procedure to the patient so that patient feels comfortable and gets ready and gets ready for the procedure without any fear and before the procedure we have to take informed consent for the procedure and patient should be kept nil orally for 4 to 8 hours before the procedure so that to reduce the risk of aspiration so the patient should be instructed to maintain good oral hygiene to minimize the risk of introducing bacteria into the lungs during procedure so patients uh, dentures glasses or contact lens uh, should be removed and uh, safely stored uh, before administration of pre procedural medications like atropine to minimize the secretions and also to prevent the vagal induced bradycardia and midazolam is also used to relieve the patient's anxiety and to sedate the patient so reassurance should be given to the patient so that while performing the procedure, he can be able to breathe during the procedure. And monitoring of the patient's saturation and pulse rate should be carefully monitored and uh, the cardiac activity of the patient should be uh, monitored by connecting ECG leads. And if you can Before hold there, Pawan. The bronchoscope. Pa Pawan. Yes, sir. It, it's also important that the, every patient should be connected to the oxygen with the nasal prongs so that you, you cannot connect oxygen with a mask because yes, you need to perform the bronchoscopy but every patient must be connected with oxygen at nasal prongs at around two to four liters even though the saturation is 95 98 percent at room air because once the foreign body the scope gets into the airway some patients will panic and some patients will go into spasm there may be secretions so it, it's very important along with the monitor you should be connected to oxygen before starting the procedure continue yes, sir. Yes. before insertion of the bronchoscope uh, patients nasopharynx and oropharynx are topically anesthetized with the lignocaine spray and the scope is inserted through the nose or mouth and into the pharynx. After the scope passes into the larynx and through the glottis, more lignocaine is sprayed into the trachea to prevent cough reflex. So the scope is passed further well into the trachea, bronchi and first and generation bronchioles for systemic examination of bronchial tree. If any pathology condition is suspected, biopsy and uh, alveolar ball um, collection and all, washing and all taken and sent for cytology and microbiological mm -hmm. analysis. If bronchoscope is performed for pulmonary toileting, each bronchoscope is aspirated until it is clear. And uh, in patients already having uh, pre-existing pulmonary diseases, uh, performing this bronchoscopic procedure may further impair their breathing. Hold on, Pawan, one second. Bronco, oh. the bronchoalveolar yes, lavage fluid is connected into a mucus strap or mucus extractor. It is important that you connect this chamber only when the bronchoscope is in the trachea and when you are going down towards the bronchi. We should not connect the this mucus extractor beforehand because when you are going through the nose and pharynx, you may end up collecting the secretions from the mouth itself. So the collection chamber must be connected when you are in the airway, when you are in the trachea, not before. And the same collection chamber, mucus extractor should be disconnected before you start coming out. 
that's very important step when you are especially when you are doing it to collect a sample for microbiological studies in infections continue yes. after performing the procedure patient should be instructed not to take anything for 2 hours until tracheobronchial anesthesia has worn off and gag reflex has returned if biopsy specimens are removed patient should be observed um, observed the sputum for any hemorrhage small amount of blood streaking may be expected and it is normal for several hours and large amount of bleeding can cause spoilage of lung and it may cause contamination of the opposite lung also so patient should be closely observed um for any evidence of impaired respiration or laryngospasm and uh, after intubation vocal cords may go into spasm so emergency resuscitation equipment should be readily available inform the patient that post bronchoscopy fever often develops within first 24 hours if tumor is suspected um collect a post bronchoscopic sputum sample for cytological analysis warm saline gargles and lozenges may helpful if patients develop sore throat and chest x ray may be ordered to identify any pneumothorax um after doing a deep biopsy for the deep biopsy the complications after performing the procedures are fever and bronchospasm hemorrhage after taking if if biopsy is taken and hypoxia pneumothorax if deep biopsy specimen are taken infection laryngospasm and chances of aspiration cardiac events like arrhythmias respiratory depression and hypotension so children are at higher risk of developing hypoxia than adults because they have smaller bronchus the bronchoscope can significantly decrease the available space for them to breathe so the various contraindications for the performing the bronchoscopic procedure um respiratory contraindications like uncorrectable hypoxia if the saturation is less than 70 mm of hg and patients with hypoventilation with severe hypercapnia or patients with severe bronchospasm and patients having tracheal stenosis the cardiovascular contraindications like patients having recent mi within 6 weeks or patient with unstable angina or uncontrolled left ventricular failure and patient with unstable arrhythmias severe hypertension and patient having cerebrovascular and carotid diseases and neurological contraindications like patient having active seizures and having raised intracranial tension and severe agitations and other contraindications like uncooperative patients and bleeding diathesis and decreased platelet count or platelet dysfunction and patient having severe anemia and a patient with cirrhosis of liver with portal hypertension or serum creatinine more than 3 mg so let's have a difference present basic difference present between the bronchoscope and the endoscope in bronchoscope there is a flexion river liver will be present which helps to uh, move the bronchoscope up and down directions but in bronchoscope the lateral movements are not possible which can be performed by the operator whereas in endoscope it contains deflection control knob which helps in performing up move, upward and downward movements along with lateral movements whereas in bronchoscope it is a diagnostic and having a limited therapeutic value whereas in endoscope it is having both diagnostic and therapeutic values Sir, at this stage, any questions, sir? Yeah, wait for a minute. Let's see. Sir, is a uh, scopy different for pediatric and adults, sir, or is? Uh... 
Yes, yes, yes. Pediatric scopes are uh, much smaller in diameter, considering their airways are much smaller. Okay. Uh, there are separate pediatric rigid bronchoscopes, pediatric flexible bronchoscopes. Adults ones cannot, you cannot be shoved through the uh, children's throat. Okay. Definitely. And uh, any major question from the PGs? Sir, I have a question, sir. Yeah. Sir, uh, in order, uh, people with aspiration pneumonia, how much quantity does mm -hmm. they really aspirate for it to cause aspiration pneumonia, sir? Because we, while using bronchoscope, we do mm -hmm. a lot of bronchial large. So, what is the maximum cutoff which you should use saline for to prevent the damage? Uh, any any value is there, or is just a random? No, 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 no. There is no such absolute value because patient care, even if you aspirate 10 ml in a conscious patient, he will be violently coughing. In a neurologically disoriented where cough reflex is absent, you may aspirate even half a liter of oil also. So the quantity of aspiration is, is not, uh, you cannot quantify in a given patient. Okay, sir. And the amount of, uh, like once you are aspirated, whatever you aspirate will go into the alveoli. It will not remain in your major airway for you to visualize inspect. Yes, sir. When you are washing out, you are keep the scope at the segmental bronchi based on your x-ray and CT findings as to which part of the lung is aspirated. And then you give a saline wash and see that the return fluid that comes back should be clear. How oh. much? I, I don't think there is any particular fixed quantity. Uh, there are patients uh, where we have used up to 150, 200 ml saline at times. Not, not routinely though. Uh, so there is no fixed quantity. Abdul, yes, sir. Not, not for you, the other PGs. What is the common lung or common segment involved in aspiration pneumonia? The right lower Any lobe. Pain? Right lung. Right, right lower lobe. Why? More spread. Sir, not direct, sir. Yes. Trachea and the right main is in, in, in a line. Aspiration yes, generally sir. happens when you are lying down. And in a lying down position, the apical segment in the right lower lobe is most dependent. So RB6 on the right side is the most commonly aspirated segment. You are right. Yeah. Shall we proceed to rigid bronchoscope? Sir, I have a small question, sir. Yeah. Mm. Sir, why flexible bronchoscopy is more diagnostic in hemoptysis patients, sir? Uh, give me a little time to explain this. Uh, in patients with hematemesis, which you guys are familiar, when the patient comes with vomiting blood, you may even have accompanied with the patient to the endoscopy room and you may have seen the findings. In patients with esophageal varices or dualophyes lesion, you can diagnose as well as do therapeutic, either clipping or ligation or cautery or anything. So you can stop a torrential or potentially life-threatening bleeding and control it completely. That is the beauty of endoscopy in hematemesis. Similarly, if you find a tumor in the esophagus or stomach, you can take a biopsy and come out. You can't uh, do a therapeutic value there. So if you compare patient with hemoptysis, that is coughing blood, if you find a tumor in the airways, you can uh, you document where the tumor is and you can take a biopsy and you can prove the diagnosis. Majority of the life-threatening bleeding in lung comes from the disease in the lung parenchyma. Maybe an active infection like TB, aspergilloma, necrotizing pneumonia, all of these lesions which cause life-threatening bleeding is beyond visualization. Based on your CT, you know that the disease is in the right upper lobe or left lower lobe. And you do a bronchoscopy to mainly to confirm before you endo, go into endobronchial uh, interventions or bronchial artery embolization or surgery. You want to make sure it's the, that segment and that lobe which is bleeding. So in a patient with tumor, same as upper GI endoscopy or colonoscopy. In a patient with life-threatening hematemesis, bronchoscopy is more of a diagnostic rather than therapeutic. That is the major limitation between upper GI endoscopy versus bronchoscopy. 
there are few patients in whom uh, we do spray tissue fibrin glue and other materials that you can do only when you have specifically noted a segment or a subsegmental bronchus you cannot generally spray a glue or a material foreign material into a lobar bronchus because you are obstructing that lobar bronchus which results in secretions being pent up getting infected you make the matter worse okay only in select patients of hemoptysis where you can specifically locate segment or a subsegmental bronchus where the bleeding is from and is not suitable for other interventions only then you do a therapeutic procedure through bronchoscopy very limited scope have you understood or do you have any questions yes sir understood sir others yes sir yes sir okay continue yeah rigid bronchoscope so this is a straight and hollow metal tube and uh, the procedure can be performed under general anesthesia and it is used to dilating the airways so the indications for the the important indications for performing the rigid bronchoscopy is removal of the foreign bodies and in case of malignancies or uh, debulking of the tumor and um laser resection or stent placement in case of intraluminal surgeries the main advantage of the rigid bronchoscopy is as it has a wider channel so that we can able to um get larger biopsies and foreign bodies can be easily grasped and removed and it has a superior suction capability so the absolute contraindications for the uh, rigid bronchoscopy are inability to adequately oxygenate the patient during procedure and coagulopathic disorders and bleeding diathesis which cannot be corrected and aneurysms and marked kyphosis and patients having recent mi or unstable angina patients having respiratory failure and requiring mechanical ventilation so while performing rigid bronchoscopy general anesthesia should be given with no endotracheal tube or with only a small bore catheter the patient should be in working dog position that is the patient should be in supine position with head is elevated by 10 to 15 cm by placing a pillow beneath the occipital region and the neck is flexed and head is extended at the atlanto occipital joint so there are two methods to introduce the rigid bronchoscope one is direct method which can be directly through the glottis whereas other through the laryngoscope that is glottis exposed with spa spatula type of laryngoscope and bronchoscopy is introduced to that laryngoscope the laryngoscope is withdrawn in infants and in young children in adults having short neck and thick tongue hold on pawan initially when you are trying to do rigid yes, bronchoscopy getting the orientation to see the epiglottis vocal cords is little difficult with the bronchoscope rigid bronchoscope so you use the laryngoscope assistance to visualize the epiglottis and then to take the rigid bronchoscope into the airway and then as the experience becomes better then you just take the rigid bronchoscope directly to visualize the pharynx epiglottis vocal cords and then get into the airway that's all the two methods that you are describing continue yes so uh, coming to the procedure of the rigid bronchoscopy so the the piece of gauze is placed on the upper teeth of the patient to avoid injury and proper size of the bronchoscope bronchoscope should be selected and it should be lubricated with a swab of autoclaved liquid paraffin or jelly so the scope is the shaft of the scope should be hold in right hand in a pen like fashion and retract the upper lip and guide the bronchoscope with left hand looking through the scope 
we can identify the tip of the epiglottis and pass it through the scope behind it and the epiglottis is lifted forward to expose the glottis and the scope should be rotated in a clockwise direction so that tip is in the axis of the glottis once the scope entered into the trachea and the scope is rotated back into the original position gradually advancing the scope and the tracheobronchial tree should be examined the axis of the bronchos bronchoscope should be corresponding with the axis of the trachea and bronchi direct vision right angle and retrograde telescope can be used for the magnification of detailed examination so biopsy of the lesion can be performed um in the case of suspicious area and secretions can be collected for cytological and bacteriological examinations after the procedure the patient should be kept in the humid atmosphere and uh, observe the patient for any respiratory distress due to laryngeal spasm or subglottic edema unduly pro prolonged or repeated introduction of the rigid bronchoscope which may leads to inspiratory strider or suprasternal retraction which is a need for tracheostomy so the precautions while performing rigid bronchoscopy is select the appropriate size of the rigid bronchoscope and do not forcefully through the closed glottis and repeated removal and introduction should be avoided and the procedure should not be prolonged more than 20 minutes in case of children and in infants so the possible complications of the rigid bronchoscopy is injury to the teeth hemorrhage after taking biopsy from the suspicious site hypoxia and cardiac arrest and laryngeal edema thank you sir. i have deliberately asked him to keep it short and sweet so that limited knowledge required for the pgs is given this topic can go on for hours together anyway presentation is done if you have any questions sir any uh, uh, complication he said no sir any uh, bleeding which is not stop or any perforation while doing rigid bronchoscope then what we will uh, do sir when you are doing rigid bronchoscopy specifically with intent to debulk a tumor in the trachea or a main bronchus which is causing difficulty acute respiratory distress once you debulk it obviously it is going to bleed so you tampon at put the pressure with the scope itself wait for maybe 2 minutes 5 minutes if it does not stop you may can use various uh, electrocautery or uh, gas pieces or uh, cotton swab soaked in adrenaline diluted adrenaline solution and there are various methods to go on uh, and you have to wait have some patience and wait till the bleeding and the oozing stops you can't just walk away saying that it will stop anyway okay okay sir yeah anything else sir, uh, sir uh, indications uh, of uh, trans bronchial biopsy sir like uh, what is uh, the present uh, indications for that like uh, in, in commonly done yeah, endobronchial ultrasound and biopsies commonly done in the west in india also for staging the lung cancer say when you have a patient with lung tumor you need to evaluate the mediastinal nodes for n2 status patients with uh, whether lymph nodes are involved or not in the olden days we used to do mediastinoscopy current standard indication is endobronchial ultrasound and bronchoscopic transbronchial biopsy that is the commonest procedure mediastinal lymph nodes or tumor biopsy but any tumors within the lung parenchyma which is not visualized which is not seen endobronchially you can localize it with endobronchial ultrasound and then avoid the vessels which are around the vessels and take a biopsy from those tumors thank you sir does it answer your question up to yes sir thank you sir yeah sir uh i want to ask about the medical legal aspect sir can mm. a general surgeon do it there is no question of whether i can do it or you can do it ent surgeons intensivist general surgeon anyone can do it provided you have been through training somebody who does it routinely and you have the technique to do it 
Okay. I, I don't think there is any certificate or a course for it. Okay. okay. You, 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 you should know what you are doing, basically. You should know what precautions to take, when to do, when not to do. And having started doing the procedure, when to stop and say, this patient is not going to tolerate, let me come out. So you, you should have seen enough and you should know what you are doing. And you should have the backup equipment, backup uh, in the ICU setting or in the operation setting where you, you should not be doing these procedures in the ward, obviously. Yes. So if the patient goes into laryngospasm or bronchospasm, cannot ventilate, you should have the intubation facility. So all those backups should be there. I don't think there is a restriction to say general surgeon can't do it or ENT can't do it. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Hmm. Dr. Chikan. Yes, sir. Uh, how do you manage a bronchospasm or laryngospasm as you are doing the procedure? You will take the scope out immediately and then what do you... What yeah, of course, you, you must tell if the, the patient is breathing well and no spasm before and then you start doing it and goes into spasm, first thing is take out the scope. Yeah. And then give adequate bronchodilators as well as steroids. Wait for the bronchospasm to spittle. If it settles within two, three minutes or five minutes and saturation comes back to normal without requiring large amounts of oxygen, say the patient was maintaining good saturation at room air, you have connected, the, say, two to four liters of oxygen, and then bronchospasm is relieved and then comes back to a normal saturation, then you can think of doing it again. Mm -hmm. But if it takes five, ten minutes for the bronchospasm to be relieved, then I wouldn't continue doing a scope in that patient. It, it's a common problem that we see when you are doing bronchoscopy. Yeah. Anything else? Pawan, you have done good presentation. Thank you very much. Good night, guys. If not, there are no more questions. Right. Thank you, Rajshikar. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you, sir. you. Thank and you, sir. good night. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Good night. Thank you.